need it fixed so I don't. <laughs> Technology is always a real problem. Okay, so whatever it says, the key thing that I want to get out of this is co experiencing here. <laughs> this ability that our mind can be not just here and now, but can also drift, also, I believe, is our um, makes us able. Ah, thank you. Let me know. Okay. Um, makes it, uh, uh, gives us this ability to have co experiences with other human beings or with other creatures too, and other even imagined beings. So, I want to start with co experiencing here and then come to my talk and what I can actually deliver here. Co experiencing is something that is not so problematic if two people or two creatures are at the same place at the same time. In that moment, of course, co-experiencing just happens from the situation that we are in. But, no, sorry. Uh, oops. Now it's frozen here. Okay, we'll be, we'll be stuck in this one spot here. What is happening now? Ah, now we have a new kind of issue. I have to get out of the show for one second here because I do want to move on from this kind of one slide here. Let's try this again. But that allows me to do it this time. Hope that I'm still sharing the screen as I should. Yes, human beings can also do something else. And that is, we can make the experiences that one person had or made up available to other people. We can talk about that experience that we've had. And then the other person can start to somehow, let's say, imagine them, reproduce them in their own mind and thereby behave as if they had been at that same place on all levels. That means that it can become part of our memory. There's a little bit of a sharing aspect. We see uh, mental activity, uh, activities that correspond to that, what we've thought. So human beings have solved the problems, the problem to, so to share experiences. And that is amazing. If you compare to all other animals that are very similar to us. I mean, but are usually a, a, of the kind of person who would say, would emphasize our similarity with non-human creatures. But in this one aspect of making imagined or past experiences available to others in such a way that they can also have these experiences to some degree, we seem to be rather unique. We have made co-experiences cool mobile. We've made them, we have found many ways, of course, to deliver them. We also use arts and technology to produce experiences that more than one person can have. It is a truly amazing ability. ability. So my large question, and I will not answer all aspects of that, as you can imagine, because I don't know all the answers, this is to really understand how is this possible? How can we share experiences that are past experiences? What allows that? How is that possible? And, and, on, and we're asking that question on all different levels. The claim that I want to kind of get to today is to say that we use one specific vehicles vehicle that allows us for doing this co-experiencing, and that has to do with narratives. I believe that narratives, stories, I use, today I will use narratives and stories as the kind of same, same thing, um, as something that enables us in some way, trains us, and then also rewards us for co-experiencing. So rewarding is also a key part of that. All three of them are critical terms here. But that's the overall claim that I want to get to. Um, so it is, I believe, that by means of narratives, and the, however we code narratives, that we can share experiences. And once we have brought something in a narrative form, it is in principle something we can remember well, but also something we can share. That is the starting point for this. And this is where my talk then, the, really the, the, the features of it will come into it, because I will ask basically, so what do we know about narratives? Narratives are everywhere. Everyone has some ideas about it, but I want to see what we can actually even study about it. I'll do this in four steps. The first step is the longest. So when you see that we are still in the middle of the talk and we're still in the first point, don't despair. Even I will end potentially, at least there's a chance. Then we'll you, so we'll start with zero reproduction, um, which is a telephone game of narratives that is a tool to show us what sticks in narratives. Um, then we'll um, do a brief look at ChatGPT, 
a story reteller to compare to the human data that we have. Um, the point is not so much to, again, kind of finger point uh, to ChatGPT. Uh, many people are doing that right now. Oh, ChatGPT, this and that. I use it more as a way, as a tool to come back about something really interesting about human narrative cognition. Um, then, if time permits, I hope it does, we'll come to um, the grim fairy tales that are also a product of retelling and come to a very brief conclusion at that point. That's the menu here. So I'll start with a, the with a method that I, that I want to use or as one potential tool, we have a couple of experimental studies that we use to try to understand what happens in narratives and in narrative thinking. And one of them is um, the telephone game um, or called more technically serial reproduction where people um, tell stories in chains. I mean, one person tells it to the next person who then in their own words passes it on to the next person and so on and so on. Um, it's an old method that has been used to measure change and adaption. Um, it's basically, uh, it allows to see how information can last and um, create cultures and civilizations over long periods of time. Because one of the most stable things we have of cultures is their stories or their laws and their myths. But they also change. And the interesting thing about it is that this method of theory reproduction, of having reproducing something over and over, remembering it over and over again, it can be the same person remembering things, or as we do it with different people, it allows you to simply tell what is what's up. In some cases, you have stability. The pyramids are the pyramids of pyramids. In some cases, and that's very common, something decays. When you transmit something, like in our case, stories, they get shorter and shorter and shorter. A lot of the details drop out um, and so on. But then you also, of course, have innovations where something gets transformed in the process of retelling it in different ways. So you could start basically with the, uh, the pyramids and you end up in the, at the Sydney Opera House and other kind of things. You have a lot of inventions. These kind of inventions and changes can happen in two, uh, basically driven by two forces. One is adaption to the environment. The world has changed. So you need different kinds of buildings. You need different kinds of stories and myths to protect you for what's coming. We live in a world of climate change. We might need different stories than other people before us. Um, but there's another aspect, which is also that the stories become more memorable. The stories become better so that we can, can retell them better. It could be rhyme and certain kind of phrases that just have a certain sound to it that they stick to us. They, they're better, um, work better with our cognitive apparatus. These studies go back to one of the founding fathers of psychology, Frederick Bartlett. He coined this, uh, this method of zero reproduction. And it's actually interesting what he found, because I will show you that we found something that's a little bit different from what he found. One of the approaches he used was drawings. He used stories and drawings. So he started, he gave one of his participants a drawing of an Egyptian owl. You see Egyptian is kind of the, the, the theme here for, for the moment. He started with an Egyptian barn owl. By the way, the only animal the, the Egyptians presented not in profile. And he gave it to his participants. They, they saw this drawing and then um, he would take it away and they had to do it from memory again. So, so some of his redraws here did something odd. It became this fluffy being with ears, like this little fluff form. So if you get this thing here and you have to redraw it, it becomes more challenging because it's, you don't know what to go for. So he absorbed that somehow the wing, that was this little wing thing, becomes this tail, tail, ears become bigger and bigger, and suddenly you have a black hat. And once you have a black hat, what happens is it sticks. He kept going, but it was black hat, it's black hat, black hat, black hat, black, black hat. But the owl didn't stick as well. So the finding that Bartlett's famous for is that he said what is sticking is that the stereotypes, we would nowadays speak of schema, the prior or priors, we also sometimes call this, the prior ideas stay and stick. That's what he talked about for images and stories. And then for stories, he also said basically, the rational part of the story or the causality of the story, why someone was doing something to someone is that which is the core of the story is that, and once you have that, 
it remains the same. So you did something similar with stories. So causality is that which remains. And that's kind of the standard assumption that people have. Stereotypes and these causal, simple stories are that which sticks. Not what we found. But, oh, kind of what we found. Now, there's one pro problem um, from what um, Barbara did. And we already see it a little bit in the Egyptian owl, not as much, but it's even more obvious in the stories that we used. The most famous one, called the War of the Ghosts, is a story that he took from um, Native Americans of the West Coast that he gave to his participants who were in England at that time. He was at Cambridge in the 1920s. So the story for them was rather foreign, alien. There were mythical elements in it, ghosts. But ghosts are not ghosts in every culture. Even that was not as a concept so clear. Um, so what did these people do when they retold it? Well, it was a very strange story to them. So of course they made it more without even maybe planning to do so. They adapted it to their own English culture. So they normalized it in that sense. So he used a rather odd case of a really story that didn't make sense to people. And then he observed, oh yeah, the retellings made a little bit more sense. They rationalized it in that sense. It's actually, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Is that, um sort of what's going on with the owl, where the owl is less familiar than the cat. Uh, was it a similar experiment, sort of? Than... Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, exa exactly. Okay. The, the yeah. common um, trend, and I would emphasize that more than Bartlett himself does, is the common trend here is that something that's more foreign, I mean, Bartlett would say it doesn't conform to the prior expectation, the, the stereotypes or the schema, is made into something that's more common. Mm -hmm. That's a pattern that he observes. Thank you, thank you. Now, this pattern exists. So lots of studies, including very contemporary studies, have confirmed that such an effect exists, especially if you use something that's really foreign to you and very alien in some sense. That doesn't make sense. But 99%, well, it's a made up number, but I would just start say the very large amounts of stories that we actually tell and retell, gossip, everyday talks, the little stories, even the fiction that we usually read, they are in more familiar territory for us. Um, people spend four to six hours a day enmeshed in stories by several estimates. Um, and they don't usually have a story that doesn't make sense because that's not the one that you would pass on. You tell things that you know. And that's kind of where we start. We want to say, well, okay, can we use everyday stories and see how they change? How are they optimalized? How are they adapted? What is the essence of stories that it sticks when we use the more everyday stories um, that are closer to us? So we did two um, compare studies here to compare this. And you know, but these are the two that I present. In one st uh, study, we asked um, a couple of hundred participants to tell us a short story. And in this case, we asked them to have it a happy, sad, mildly happy, mildly sad story, but without using those kind of words. In another, the other story, we built a lot of um, stories and we used uh, a much wider range also now of emotions that would play a role in these stories. Um, and then for each of the stories we built, we built variations of the endings. So if it was an embarrassing story, let's say, or surprising story, we changed from the ending from mildly surprising to very surprising, the little steps, we built like seven to 10 variations. We gave all these stories to people to retell. Each person would get a story and would be asked to retell it in your own words. Then they came to another person who again was asked to retell it in their own words. We did this in writing because we didn't, there were too many complications for us to do it with a lot of people in oral communication and trying to think about whether we want voice in or not. So we did this for three generations until we had a lot of comparative stories. We used a lot of people. So um, for the second study where we created the stories, we used 16,000 participants um, and we collected a total, of, I think for both of these studies, 27, 20, uh, yeah, 27,000 retellings. So we had a basis to see what are the trends, what is happening in these kind of stories. Now. We also then used a lot of um, human readers for the evaluations of every story. So every story was read, absolute minimum of three, but the average was five people read each of these stories and evaluated them by a whole set of criteria. So we rated them for emotions, whatever the 
starting emotion voice um, and others sometimes we use um, the things that played a role for Bartlett, causality, rationalization, we broke that down in a couple of features, and quality measures to, to say whether that gives us an indication what remains. We used in Bayesian analysis for this. We don't have to understand it. The key thing is two things. We're looking at an overall trend. So this is the original story. It goes to the third retelling. Um, this, is, this is a new Bayesian method that we developed. It's available on the internet can only advocate that other people use it. So far, we're the only ones using it. There's one evolutionary study in biology that is using it right now. Um, so it measures generational change. And here it measures the intensity of, of whatever we look at, how happy it is, how sad it is, how rational it is, and how good the story is. It shows a trend line, an overall one. But there's another measure, which is this, where that compresses over that expands. I mean, this is something that gets closer to each other or not. So we're tracking those kind of two things. So first thing finding, causality, rationalization, the things that Arthur is talking about. This is a trend. This is the raw data that's how looking is cleaned up. It, they decline. Causality, I mean, it's, it's still there. I mean, it's not going red down. I mean, if it starts like the average rating of being like 5.5 .5 out of seven, suddenly it goes then down to yeah, 4.2, something like that. That's not so bad. I mean, people, people, rationalization, causality of stories matters to people. When we tell a story, it usually we try to keep it to make uh, making sense. Um, but we found something different. And this was this is actually why we run so many participants because our statistician was skeptical, John Krushke, he said. This is too good. You don't get data that look like nothing has changed. This is just impossible. So we had to do this several times. And he looked at it very convincing. I mean, he was involved in all phases. So we were all doing this together at any phase. But we did not see notable change of several emotions. Why now these retellings, and I will show you examples uh, a little bit later on. They ch changed radically. I mean, they started out with 15 sentences typically and ended up with three sentence stories. So it's not that everything was just the same. No, the one thing that stayed the same were several emotions. Um, so that was true for happiness, for sadness, for embarrassment. Don't be fooled that there's just a few lines. These, these are 20, no, this is for, for embarrassment. It's like four, between four and 5,000 stories. So there's a lot of data in these kind of things. Embarrassment also, the trend is that embarrassment stays the same. It, there's a little bit of compression here. Side note, that is interesting, but it's also alarming. It means that, of course, highly embarrassing stories become a little bit less, but small, low-level embarrassment is increased towards this mean here. That means if there's something slightly embarrassing, it sticks and it becomes more. That is about shame. So stay in stigma. Stigma is communicated better than we want it to be. It really does remain. Um, that's a side finding, but yes, please. Um, it's a little hard. I mean, it seems that it's granted from the actual data, but is it possible that by the having shorter stories, they're necessarily contesting the range of emotional? Um, well, that, good thought. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you uh, In psychology, of course, we know these trends and other data things. We know that the compression to the mean would be a very normal and expected kind of thing. Um, it's it's um, it, it, the interesting thing for us that this compression, especially towards the mean, only happens for embarrassment, actually. It doesn't happen for most other things. So, in, in fact, um, here, just as an example, several other emotions like disgust this deteriorate. So we don't see this compression effect at all. Um, and other kind of and, and rationalization was also not compressing. There seems to be something fairly specific from, I mean, we looked at some other criteria that I didn't put up here, that only embarrassment shows that trend. So that indicates to us that it's not just the, it's the abbreviation in this case, but it's a deliberate, meaning people kind of want the, this, the embarrassment in the middle of the story. And that seems to be unique for that. So it's not a general trend. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. I guess it's a little hard to, uh, it's, it's like hard to know, like, to sort of like randomly change the story, like what would be expected to be. I mean, it's just sort of like features of the English language, they're gonna make it different. 
Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, so there's a lot of factors. I will show briefly to point to some linguistic analysis too. Um, for us, what is interesting, I mean, in case of disgust, um, is still, I mean, it does, I mean, this is, uh, it means that in the shrinking of the stories, the fact that the, the disgust rating remains overall high and the same, that people somehow lock into that. And of course, again, people, we never use, at least in the starting stories, explicit ad adjectives. There's not just one word to say, oh, this is disgusting or surprising or so. It's really situational. So people have to recreate a situation that causes that effect. There's not one feature alone that we could identify. I'll show some other data in that in a, in a minute here. Mark. If Robin Dunbar were here, and he yes. would raise his hand and explain that the role of embarrassment mm -hmm. in recall mm -hmm. is actually evidence for his theory that gossip is part of the origins of human language. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, exactly, yes. Yes, no, Robin Dunbar is one of the people that we are very interested in. Tomasello, too. There's, yes, yes, Dunbar, Dunbar is famous for his argument that humans replace the grooming of the other primates with gossiping. Okay. We so groom each other. Picking with. nips out of each other's fur, yes. yeah. picking nips out of each other's behavior. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's more efficient okay. because you can do it with several people at once and you can do it while you're doing other productive things. <laughs> <laughs> voila, voila. It, it sounded like an outlandish theory, but I actually, it, it's fairly a, a, a belief nowadays. A lot of people agree with that. Okay, so so um, first finding here, I mean, um, first finding is uh, emotions and retelling have specific patterns. There's a, uh, a, a range of them. I mean, the studies we have so far, we're very confident about joy, sadness, and surprise. Um, embarrassment shows, not quite as extreme, but shows a compression pattern, but at a high level. And then there's a couple of ones that slightly decline, risk, thrill, fear. Um, I won't go into those data here today. Um, and then there's some that really are not good narrative emotions. Disgust, there's specific things about disgust. Again, I will, for reasons of time, not go there right now. There's another aspect is now the stories change a lot. I see two questions here. I want to let, let me finish this one sentence here. The um, sometimes the part that would be needed, I mean, the story started always with two events, the ones that we built. Sometimes the part that was emotional in the beginning is not the part that's emotional later on. Sometimes even the embarrassment part can be a different person who's embarrassing. So it's not the people that's the carrier. So there's weird things how things move along. We had two hands up here. Um, I do not know your name, so we can negotiate who goes first. Are you both pointing at each other? Okay. Uh, I just have a small verifying question, which was on the graphs you showed us just prior. Are all of the different independent lines different um, different stories, yes. or are they different uh, like scale point stories? If you would ask people to write like a mildly sad and mildly, is it each of those scale points the starting point, or is it just like? Every single story you had anyone write. If, well, uh, yes, every every single story is is a storyline, and and then it's a little bit because it's too many of them. So then then um, John has kind of created some kind of way to kind of bundle like twenty stories into one overall like likely uh, likely. Item. But each line is basically has as many participants in that kind of performance as the other ones, so they equal on that level. Does that? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so in the previous slide, your summary, um, oh, did you mention this? So is there any control for uh, story length and recreation? So I can imagine mm -hmm. you're not like this, you're lazy. Right? Mm -hmm. so you're asked to retell a story, and you're going to do it in fewer words. And yes. Progressively, you see shorter and shorter stories, and so your stories are getting shorter and shorter. So, mm -hmm. um, so yep. I can imagine, you know, when you're reducing the dimensionality of stories over maybe retellings just for that reason alone, would you get mm -hmm. the same reduction in these yeah. dimensions? Because for whatever reason, you know, when you're reducing total mm -hmm. words, you mm -hmm. can't express the same, something like that. Yes, yes. It, uh, so absolutely, people who do zero reproduction studies, they know at some point there's a leveling, they call it, where something, it just becomes more and more identical. Interestingly, um, we saw less than we thought of that. So mostly this development, and we looked at it in many different ways, it's still fairly lin linear, continuous. Of course, it becomes the less, um, but I'll show you some data about the chat GPT retelling that has a very uh, almost shocking, actually, I find it a completely striking finding in that regard that even the later phases when the stories are fairly short, 
something happens, I won't give it away quite yet. We'll get to that point of it, it, regardless of how many people interrupt. I mean, I think that I can. I told you what I'm going to interrupt. So, so uh, it's, it's, that effect is not as strong as we thought. Uh, so the, also the, con the, the rate of reduction of the stories is fairly constant. Everyone reduces 40% somehow. Everyone allows themselves, yeah, okay, it's an ex experiment. I'm a little bit lazy, but not fully. <laughs> so, so, so somehow it's not that bad. Yes, okay. Uh, you're not spending too much time on this, too, actually, but um, one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, the classic kind of uh, just say again experiments where you just give someone yes. stuff and then you say, okay, say it again. Yes. They, um, they reduce the complexity of mm -hmm. a lot of the original utterance. They only remember yes. some sorts of things. And it happens to, I guess, the way I think we typically interpret it, mm -hmm. they got like what the gist of you know mm -hmm. the message was mm -hmm. um and that's what they remember and so they're sort of trying to reconstruct the words you'd use to convey that gist um and so i'm sort of wondering like mm -hmm. in terms of the task design i know you didn't ask them to in the words you showed us mm -hmm. but it i guess what i'm seeing sort of like is it possible that the gist in question they thought of the nature of the task was you know uh capture Certain mm -hmm. feeling, you know, and maybe there's certain assumptions about like, mm -hmm. well, you don't want to up the disgust in kind of like a, mm -hmm. a story that you're doing for an experiment, but maybe I would if I was with my friends who yeah. love gory horror or something. Like, yes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I kind of wonder about that kind of like the task driven effects of like a general good. distraction. Uh, Excellent. Oh, no, 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 it's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, very quick, I will come back to those things. First thing is the gist tends to be what people talk about the story. They think about that as this causal thing. But there's another thing that I think people have not looked at, which is these emotions that also lead to story transformations. The gist is not as stable as people think. Um, so that I think people have to think about it. You're absolutely right, of course, about audience effects we were very careful never to say oh please make it rational or mm -hmm. consider the emotions in fact we we kind of we went to links to when to some of these studies were run on prolific or mechanical talk but where you get these thousands of people and so on to make very sure that we detach them even by time intervals with any study that had anything to do with either rationality or emotions. So that because there's these blocks, we, we, we employ a lot of people there. And so they talk to each other and they didn't want any contamination there. But audience effect play, play a huge role. If you instruct people to tell it more entertainingly, they will do so. They will even forget more, leave out more facts and forget them too, interestingly, and so on and so on. There's lots of these kind of things. Here's just an example. I won't read this one here, just from the link, original story and the later one with some interesting changes. I don't want to go there. Yeah, first, half, the first summary, but it's not the conclusion at all yet, is that some emotions are the, seem to be the implicit goal of retelling, to maintain those emotions. People may not be aware of it, that somehow we suggest that that is, in the retelling process, a key part. And I will bring that to a step further, but I want to do that by comparing these human retellings to retellings by ChatGPT. That will give us a clue that we didn't expect actually, and we were not quite aware of that. So in this case, what we did is, is very simple. We used the same data set, one of our data sets here of story retellings, um, where humans had told a story, so we had single chains. So we had one human tell us a story, and then we had built chains of retelling of that each time different people who would retell it in their own words. Um, and what we did is we had asked ChatGPT to do the same things. So we gave ChatGPT a story, in this, I mean, one of these human stories, and asked it to retell it. Then we would upload it on a different account on ChatGPT, tried new accounts too, um, so that ChatGPT definitely had not heard these stories. So they were created, and these were, this data set was not in the data set that ChatGPT had access to at that point. So we knew there was no prior familiarity to it. And then we did these retellings um, to compare what happened. I'll give you an example. This one, yeah, yeah, it's good enough. Let me read it. Okay, the starting one. We have a lonely neighbor. He's an older man whose wife is away a lot caring for their grandchild in another town. This leaves him at home alone. He's had health issues and so has his wife, but she insists that she's needed elsewhere 
and rarely spends time with her husband. Unfortunately, this man likes to visit with anybody that will give him the time of day. We out in the yard walking, he will come over and want to chat about politics mainly. We're always nice to him, but he never gets the hint that we are not interested in his political views. I mean, always imagine this Trump voter, but we kindly listen and say, that's nice, but we have work to do. He then ambles back to his house and watches out the window for his next chance to socialize with any neighbor that ventures into their yard. He's very long. This was the original story. And it goes through three runs of storytelling. So here too, one is chat GPT, one is the human one. You get to vote to guess which is who. So I read one of them, and I think I kind of randomized. I have to figure out which one is which. There's this wife who takes care of her husband because he's sick. She also takes care of an ill grandson that lives in another town. She tries her best to take care of both. However, her husband and her fight over politics, so she prefers to spend more of her time with the grandson. Just retelling. Second one. The story is about an older man who's frequently alone due to his wife caring for their grandchild. He has health problems, but still likes to discuss politics with his neighbors, who decline to view to vote. He spends his days looking out the window, hoping for someone to talk to. So I picked two. These are often, there's more inventions in it. These are, so who, who would say that, let's say, I guess people are probably more excited to detect ChatGPT. Who <laughs> thinks this is ChatGPT? Okay, who thinks this is ChatGPT? Okay, and, and many of you are not absolutely sure. That's <laughs> interesting, interesting. Okay, so in this case, um, this is ChatGPT, and this is the human story. And I just want to mention one or two things. ChatGPT and stories is kind of fairly boring, as I will explain. It's very good at summarizing, and it keeps absolutely stable. After the first retelling, regardless which account we use, there's no changes. It just replaces words, individual words anymore. Um, the humans kind of, they switch the story, the perspective of the story constantly. It started, the story is in the original from the neighbors, then it goes to the husband, then it goes to the wife. There's this wife. This is the story of the wife. Here the wife is just part of one dependent clause. So there's a constant shifting of the story, constant adjustment. There's an invention here, of course. Now there's a justification for the wife. Why is she not there? Yeah, they fight over politics. We don't like this husband. <laughs> so she, she doesn't like it either. That was different here. And here there's a misunderstanding by ChatGPT, also fairly typical, that here it's very clear that yeah, we are not interested in this political views, so they use the having to work as an excuse. Here, that is who decline you to work seems more like a real reason. That, yeah, they can't talk about politics. So there's a little bit of theory of mind misreading that ChatGPT does. But ChatGPT is not bad at theory of mind. We've run tests on that too. It's actually quite impressive already. Now I want to show you something that. So here's the labeling of these things. So. In our analysis, there was one thing in particular I want to get to. It's written just briefly, Google is always humans, so ChatGPT drops the length much faster and then remains mostly flat while humans kind of constantly adjust. Um, there's another interesting feature, is age of acquisition. Linguists know that one, where ChatGPT brings it higher in age, the story, more like internet language that it's trained for, while humans, and this looks like not a huge change. These are very, every, everything I showed you, every single data point is very significant. This, real data in this kind of thing. These are, it's not a confidence interval, it's just where any data lies, basically. Great. Yes, oh yeah. I have a question from Zoom. Um, can you uh, tell me more, What can you repeat what you said about chat GPT and the theory of mind? Oh, uh, so we, uh, when stories are there to be retold or problems are given, where chat GPT has to estimate about the mind of someone else, a character or a true human being. Um, the first versions of ChatGPT failed those kind of theory of mind tests, like the, the simple stories task, which is a theory of mind task and these kind of things. The latest version, ChatGPT 4, is fairly good at these tests, uh, but of course, especially those tests that already knows <laughs> because they were already on the internet. Um, in our kind of, the case that I was making here is to say that ChatGPT kind of, that there's a frequent pattern often actually made things more harmonious. So in this case, the neighbors don't want to talk to the neighbor because they're not interested in his political views. He never gets the hint that we don't want to talk, 
talk about this. So it's a little bit more unfriendly in a certain sense, but they still polite. But here, ChatGPT makes an actual statement. Oh yeah, they don't have time, they have to work. So it says in our mind, the state of the argument, the inner mind that ChatGPT time kind of omit. We actually think, but we don't have ads, they don't know that, that ChatGPT is trained to avoid in our states a little bit because it makes mistakes in that. So that's kind of what we see there. But ChatGPT, ChatGPT 4, there's now one, one study, a preprint somewhere, not from us, who someone says that the ChatGPT now performs on human levels for cognitive theory of mind, or almost at human levels in most cases. Thank you, Heather. Simon. Um, so if I understand you right, you're saying you did not explicitly or implicitly instruct chat to shorten the story. Yes. Chat chose to shorten it by a hundred words. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, down to 25% of yeah. the story. So we gave ChatGPT, I didn't, I omitted a lot of the methods, yeah. exactly the same instructions as the humans. Uh -huh. um, please retell the story in your own words yeah. and so on and so on. I mean, the entire text. And it was ChatGPT reacted quite well to that. I mean, it could perform that task remarkably well. It's in the end a very good summarization kind of thing that it does, but then it's stuck once it does it in one step and it doesn't repeat it. There's nothing novel any longer. So I'll show you, so the age of acquisition, humans become, use more childlike language, each step becomes more down to like language we acquired early, ChatGPT moves it up. Um, there's a lot of part of speech comparison that I won't go into the details here, Chat that is not so surprising uses more nouns, adjectives, and prepositions. Humans use more verbs and adverbs and negations. Each of those I could talk more about, but that's not the real point. Affect preservation. This was for, for some of us, me <laughs> in the team, surprising. Chat GPT managed to do this well. So Chat GPT honed in on the emotional situation in the original and maintained it. Very similar, use the same comparisons. There's no, there's no statistical form of difference here. And I come to the surprising finding, but yes. One thing that I think is kind of complicated about this is that uh, we know that it's kind of got essentially guardrails to avoid yes. polarizing speech. Yeah, yeah. And we don't I, really exactly know how it generalizes I know, based I know. on that kind of yeah. fine tuning. So I wonder, like, you know, if you even try to have a fight with. GPT. It right. immediately harmonizes. Right. So, yes. yeah. I, I wonder if like um kind of hard to generalize this to I think large language you know transformers per se. Yes, 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 uh, yes. Without you know being able to get through maybe that layer of a uh, fine tune. I don't know. Yes. Because it seems like that could have an effect to try to neutralize yes, emotional yes. language to yeah, I mean, so so I, I, we, we didn't, so so in our study was in a way not really about the chat GPT performance, as I will show you on the next slide. Um, but we, we still I thought it was interesting that chat GPT maintains core emotions, mm -hmm. low or high, the same way. I think in the moment we would use hate um, and affects that are related or uh, aggression, I assume we would see the, the guardrails kick in. Yeah. Negation was another thing, but I think negations were pro are probably partly controlled. Um, but I want to show you the real interesting finding, um, which is the, what we call the creativity rate. The simple way, and I can point to it in the graph, is that humans at any phase, including when the story is already short, this is in regard to the question um, earlier about do people get more lazy, at any stage replace 55 to 60% of the concepts, the language material of the story. They always find new verbal ways to express it. They re reinvent the story. They don't just kind of have some words that they repeat. And then we did, we did this with three different things, uh, synsets, root hyponyms, and lemma too, um, <laughs> each time the same pattern. Chat GPT and the graphs, um, they seem like it's not a huge difference, but the, the difference is gigantic. Chat GPT in the first step does make changes and then the drawing lens very unchanged. The changes are very small. I mean, humans would often not even notice it as a real change. While the humans, even when the story is very short, when it's already down to four sentences, when they repeat it, 55 to 60% of the concepts are <laughs> newly created. And this is this is actually, we didn't, we were not, this comparison with ChatGPT helped us to find that. So the big riddle for us is now, so when humans retell stories, what do they do? Well. 
apparently even in short stories, they replace 55 to 60% of the words and concepts, not just the dropping ones, these are actually the ones that they use, plus they also drop ones. That's, that's really like news text and news stories. It explains why the story jumps from the, the male neighbor to the female, uh, to this wife and tells her story. This was one and there will be more consistent. In many cases, this goes off much more extremely in those kind of things. It's news stories. But at the same time, the emotion remains flat, or at least a bunch of emotions. Okay, we count embarrassment kind of into that too, surprise too. And surprise, these are situational emotions that remain the same. It's not just naming it to say, oh, she was sad. It's always a situation, at least in the starting stories. It's rare that they explicit emotion words. It's context, situations, emotional arcs. I have one, let me go to one more slide and then I'll, I'll take your question here. So the way how we explain this or how we um, have um, put it into um, print is to say that when people encode a story, when they receive it, they bundle the story to some degree to an overall affect on an emotional arc that culminates in this one emotional emotion and the degree of that emotion, not just to say happy, but also the degree of it. Then when they remember or recall, retell the story, they start some of that. They know, oh yeah, it was a sur surprising story of a certain kind or embarrassing to a certain degree. And then they kind of grab elements that fit that impression of that overall emotion, which means they assemble things that are that could help them to bring about this effect. And of course, they remember a lot of them from the original ones, but they also invent now story materials and parts of stories or entire story um, branches um, that help them to bring about that effect that were not then original. So storytelling and even retelling, and of course storytelling is often always retelling, is a lot of this creative grabbing here. So we have a couple of questions I had called in. So no, see, I, was, Heather has... I was stretching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Heather's stretching, that is good. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I had you wait for a second, please. Yeah, so this could be somewhat important to the point of this slide um, uh, or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but just about the, you know, level of invention and creativity with the humans. Did I hear you or do I remember correctly that earlier you sort of, as an aside said, the instructions were retell the story in your own words. Yeah. And so how much of that task instruction bit do you think is where, you know, that may get the humans in a very different way from ChatGPT, which doesn't maybe have its own words. Um, and, and, but moreover, right, there could be sort of the, if you're a prolific participant and that's your instruction, on top of just any normal way that humans might interact with that instruction, there's a sort of social contract dimension of, well, I better not just cut and paste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, so, so there's, there's, like, there may be some expectation, well, I gotta come out with yeah. stuff of my own. Mm -hmm. then, so where those instructions will hit you very differently. That this, again, may not yeah. change this picture all that much, or it could affect it to some extent, but it could be yeah. Yeah. A, a task specific dimension. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, anyone who does experience knows that these things matter. So the instructions used in your own uh, retelling your own words, they, they are from Kashima, who is one of the people who use these serial reproduction studies since 2000, and they seem to be the best instruction. Now, interestingly, um, and we, we played all the chat with you, we, we tried some other instructions, and they, they, the differences were almost no, we didn't see them. So it was, I don't think it was that sensitive on the chat with you side. So if you want a story, Retold or anything retold very well. This is how the, the, the research has found that one set of instructions that leads to better retellings. And that is when you say, uh, oh, retell the story as if you were teaching it to someone else. You were teaching, puts people in a role um, where they suddenly tell the story. I mean, they don't shrink any longer, or much, much less. And suddenly they become full of details and so all of that. So teach a retell in your own words evokes some ideas. Teach it somehow makes people feel responsible and lift them up to that kind of thing. And then there's fewer changes. And now we have not used these studies with teach it to someone else. They were not really teachable stories. And so we didn't try it out. We tried it out in smaller sets and we see the effects much less shrinkage, but still a lot of inventions. So in that sense, people actually start to embellish more. Um, and we have not systematically looked at that yet. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, how are we doing here? Okay. Um, so um, 
Um, and then, of course, I mean, there's a lot of adjustments. And so we, we, this means these things, the, the affect is in the center, and then stories get adjusted. The drawings are about the example that we didn't get into because I saw the time slipping already here. So what is a narration? Um, so my take here is that, yes, the gist of the story matters, of course, the who did what to whom and why and when and where, but it's also this dimension that many people in the kind of the discourse process world um, have always forgotten is, well, how does it feel like to be in that situation? Um, the emotional dimensions in story analysis, they're harder to grasp. So people have neglected that. And I think for narratives and story and for this idea of co-experience, that's actually what is the core that matters. I want to go one step further, and this is where I become more speculative here. So why, these emo why is it that the emotions stay in? We know that emotions are good for memory, and we know this, but why actually? What's, what's the point of that? And what I would suggest here is that emotions in stories, these narrative emotions, are rewarding us for engaging in the narratives. They are the way um, what we get for getting into that story world in many cases. Um, and if we look at fiction now, the realm of better stories or stories that we that what that kind of people select even also on social media to uh, to choose, they often have to do with something like major emotions that excite people. Um, that can be triumph. I mean, watch any Marvel movie or so, it's usually there's a triumph of the good guys or so somewhere. And people want that. There is this emotional reward. That's where the story is supposed to end. Um, there can be erotic fulfillment. I mean, this can be both romantic love. It can also be, well, they end up in bed, finally. Um, they, but that's kind of one of these things that ends us. Another very common plot, um, according to some people, the most common one in fiction is actually the come uppens plot. The good guys go to heaven, the bad guys finally get what they deserve. Um, a lot of excitement comes about these punishment stories. And that's, again, if a story ends with some bad guy still out there until fairly recently, I mean, until I mean, already a little bit before Breaking Bad and so on, that, that was not, people didn't want that. That was, you, you couldn't have a story like that. That has changed in the last hundred years. But that's another emotional um, uh, reward, the satisfaction that comes at the end of the story. Mark. Uh, one thing maybe to add to that is that lots and lots of stories going back hundreds of years, um, it seems like the key thing is giving the protagonist um, leave to act against normal moral codes. Mm -hmm. Um, the revenge story. Yes. Someone yes. Where mm -hmm. someone has done you so much wrong, you yeah. have to just let it all hang out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and there's, I mean, I would call it a surplus. So you can let it out. I like that warning of it. Suddenly, that that punishing there go, can sometimes go over the top too. Yeah. There's something that bundles up all the energy also from the story over the emotional commitments that you had and uh, the the duration of the story. And it all is let out in that. There's some interesting aspects of that. So um, thank you, thank you. Um, there's a bunch of other ones. I mean, sometimes we are being moved, we, we, uh, things to resolve. Um, there's also more aesthetic um, endings, emotions here on that level here. Another key one, just to mention briefly, are the therapeutic effects of collective narratives. Um, there's these collective national healing stories after trauma, um, that help people overcome things. I could talk about the collected 9-11 story that emerged, um, or, or 2008, the financial crisis, um, that didn't have a collective narrative in a way with the good guys, but everyone was finger pointing at, at, the, at the greedy bankers. We found the guilty people, some greedy bankers somewhere, and that was there was a certain satisfaction in that, a certain kind of therapeutic effect of overcoming something on that level. At least that's what I would suggest. So we are now at one o'clock. If someone has to run, please, please do not hesitate to jump up. Um, now I want to make a second point here um, about the emotions as the reward for engaging in the narrative. So, so I believe the, the emotions are the carrots. For us. Why do we even engage in story thinking? Why do we do that? It's very, I mean, it's not, it comes easy to us. We are trained for think, thinking, it's very, very easy. It's probably the form of thinking that's the most 
easy, soft, close to, to daydreaming for many people. Um, but so emotions are getting us into it. But there's a certain part of it, which also means that the emotional world sets the end of the story. The end point of stories is very important. I mean, all the studies that talk about narrative episodes um, or episodical thinking, like the work by Jeffrey Sachs, so they always point to the segmentation of that. But in, in the framework that I offer here, there's a very specific reason why the end point is important. It sends us, when we mind drift, when we mind wander, kind of back to ourselves. So this mobility of conscious, there's a danger in that. We get lost in space or so. We become trekkies forever. Uh, <laughs> we, we do need sometimes an ending point. The story's over, the, and the emotion does that. The emotion gives us the point, oh yeah, okay. Whatever story it was, we come back to ourselves. And that can be, of course, I use fiction here as a, as a beautiful example, and I think fiction is very important for that. But it works also for the everyday gossip story. If a friend tells me what happened to her when she was confronting her mean boss in the office and she said shyly she was going in there and would slap her bottle on the table, I want to know how that ended. And of course, the end is an outcome, but it also can be an emotional resolution of it or something. And that allows us to end that kind of engagement. That is a very important feature of, of stories. Okay. I'll do this part. I know we have a couple of people who are specialists on fairy tales here. So I want to still give some credence to that, but I want to, don't want to keep it too long here. Um, this, this will, I'll try to do it in five minutes. Um, grim fairy tales. Probably the most famous collection of stories of the last uh, hundreds of years are the Grimm folk fairy tales. They were actually um, the first, the German folk fairy tales were the first printed folk fairy tales. People had not collected them. Um, and there's a lot of ideas about, okay, so they were also product of serial reproduction. I mean, we know in some cases they were at least 500, in some cases a thousand years old. We have some here and there, we have other older versions that pop up in some other form of communication once in a while. So we have some ideas about that, which means, we can assume that they are the product of a lot of adaption to different contexts, but also optimization for our cognitive memory and narratability of prospects. So there should be something about them that makes them very good and very smooth. But they're also very odd and they're also very unique. They're different from stories from before. The stories before, they were about specific people, not about the cat or the Little Red Riding Hood. They had names, these people, characters, when we had the, the earlier versions and so on. My suggestion here is, to put it in a short form, is to say it really is, the fairy tales are actually more complex than many people think. They're fairly complex. They have two different narrative stories that overlap each other in a weird way. One is the vulnerability arc, where you have um, a kind of more passive character who undergoes all, I mean, who's kind of set as an orphan into the wild forest alone, is subjected to dangers, and but then gets rescued, as we hope, for the more passive one. But then there's also more witty one, which is one of the examples, um, um, where there's a test happening, and these little the creatures or the kids pass that test and outwit some, um, some danger. If you think of hands on the gravel, you're both, they are set out in the forest, but they are also tested. They have to escape from the witch. And that's fairly standard that you have these two kind of different narrative things overlapping each other. But, and this is when, when I think about this kind of arts, I mean, the danger, rescue, vulnerability uh, one, and the witty one where you pass a test and then get rewarded for it. The interesting thing there is about the end point that their vulnerability, the starting point of being exposed to the world, being alone in the, in the, in the child suddenly, um, is something that in the end wins. But it's now not just only rescued, but because it's also the end point of the other arc, where the, the test, they pass the test, it's as if that vulnerability is itself a winning point. And that's, I think, what happens in these fairy tales, is that this this weakness, vulnerability, affectability by the environment, by being the most little one, is already becomes a token for us to say, 
We know this this creature will win. We don't know how it will happen, but by being little, they will win in the end. There's this becomes a shorter cut for us that vulnerability as such becomes a strategy. Once you are that, you will win. We find it moving. And we see it as the winning kind of case of that. That was novel. I mean, before that, being weak was not a good thing. Um, so vulnerability in these fairy tales is discovered to be a moral virtue. And that sounds like, yeah. for many of us, it sounds like, yeah, is it not? Well, being vulnerable it doesn't mean that you have done anything good. You're just more vulnerable. That in itself, it didn't used to be a virtue. And then it becomes also an emotionally moving endpoint. We we cry when we see these little creatures. Um, I'm making fun of that. The little creatures, the 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 weak heroes, when we see them triumph, Cinderella, Hansel and Gretel, and so on. That becomes for us the re re resolving reward of engaging in that story. That they're coming to that point. So they fit. What I want to say, why I use this example, and it's I there's some shortcuts in that. So. Yes. Um, is first of all is that vulner vulnerability itself became something like a narrative affect close to these emotions that structure stories that remains the same that becomes optimalized in story retelling maintained and even an endpoint then in this rewarding structure the second one is that it also becomes a technique of storytelling with significant effects nowadays i mean if you present yourself as vulnerable you win. That doesn't always work, of course, but in many cases, this is something that people have come to be used that vulnerability can be weaponized. It was already weaponized in the very beginning for the Grimms. It was a weaponization around 1800. Um, at that point, they were fighting the middle class. Grimms were part of this middle class. They're fighting against the aristocracy, and the aristocracy defined itself as not vulnerable, not affectable. They were blue blood from birth on. You didn't need change. But the middle class had to be vulnerable, affectable, undergo change and formation in some sense. So these fairy tales were basically already a weaponization for them. But if we see the same thing, and I'm not the same thing, but we see that now in Me Too or Black Lives Matter too, that these stories are now potent and can be used. They don't work for climate change narratives, not the same way, at least. There's some differences there. Okay, so I'm, I'm really coming to the end here, and this is very, very quick. So what I suggest here overall at this point here to get to this question, how do narratives make it possible for us to co-experience? We've only come part of the way here, but we at least would say the first thing I would say is narratives are emotion episodes, and it's these emotion episodes that make it so that one person or another person can connect on that storyline. Very important is they have a begin and an ending, the ending point that sends us back home. Um, and that I believe are at least important elements that will allow co-experience in a very nutshell kind of thing. There are some things that I have not mentioned, just point to it quickly. Um, the one thing is that while you're in a story, you always think about lots of other possibilities multivisionality of that. I have not talked about that part. That is part of story thinking too, that everything could be always come, come different. That has to be part of that overall picture too. For the linguists, I could talk about survival of words and competition and so on and so on. I won't go there. And I think my collaborators here, some of them, not all of them, I have this picture here from my lab, a trip to the Stone Age Institute where we, we show the, the wonderful tools that people in experimental humanities can use. Uh, very simple tools, storytelling, something that everyone can do and everyone has a problem. Thank you. So we are now, I think it, there's time for questions if someone wants to leave. Obviously, this is a the safe moment, so but there's I believe we still have the room, Joe. Yeah, you can uh, there are questions. Anna. You started with the example of the transformation of a static image across transmissions from person to person, and then you evolved into talking about the transformation of narratives from person to person. And and you highlighted this sort of important role of emotion in narrative. And I'm just curious to what extent you think that there's something sort of intrinsic about the structure or something about narrative that allows it to have this emotion impact 
um, or whether you could, in principle, see something similar arise across transmission of, you know, something more static. That, is there something about the sort of temporal unfolding of narrative that's really critical here? Uh, mm. You just haven't seen in that case, but could see elsewhere. Interesting question. Interesting question. I have not thought about this, but you're of course right. I mean, I'm trying to go quick. Sorry, I don't want to make you dizzy. I'm just trying to find that picture. Um, oh my gosh, this is slow. That okay. So when we go to these images here, um, whether there's a similar kind of emotional, affective satisfaction was reaching something like this. And like, it could be, if I understand your question correctly, that something about cat is very, I mean, of course, cats are also cuddly. I mean, I mean, yeah, owls, this is not a cuddly kind of creature. I mean, it's more, it's a little bit alien. It's a way kind of it's schematized along the old Egyptians, um, or that they saw it. While the cuddly animal, it becomes a cuddly animal very quickly. So there's something one could say, hmm, is there something em emotional satisfaction that you feel like, yeah, this is what I had to reproduce. It feels better that way. Maybe that comes from drawing, that the, indeed there is that dimension. I have not seen anyone walking with schema or stereotypes who would then say there is this emotional satisfaction that you've done this. It does make sense in this overall idea that you go back to your priors. You go back to prior expectation and memories. It's like in the same sense that language use and stories is more early acquired ones. You go back to your prior language, the language that you express experiences with. So maybe, a bit, but it's interesting. I've not thought about that. So thank you, thank you. Yes, and then Anna. Well, may, maybe Anna first and then. Yeah. Um, fascinating talk. Um, I was thinking about uh, another dimension of uh, your findings maybe. That has to do with the effort that it takes to produce these stories. Mm -hmm. Most of what you told us has to do with effect. What kinds of things are communicated, what mm -hmm. kinds of things they mm -hmm. transmitted, what mm -hmm. kinds of things get lost. But these things don't come out of context because there's always a bit yes. of effort that goes into producing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking about how this bears on some of your results. Mm -hmm. uh, because none of these all of these things are presumably equally easy to communicate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I think that is a very good point that. In the um, in the adaption from the retelling, um, um, where we observe this pattern of change, um, there is this tendency that people improve it. But I think there's something about effort that's that should be much more at the center of this: is that people kind of um, retell things in such a way um, that it fits their memory better, their cognition, it's easier to process. Um, so there's a tendency to smooth, like say on the linguistic side, there's a lot of words that don't usually go together. People smooth that out, they bring it more physiotopically related concepts into a line. There's probably a lot of that is, is effort um, avoidance <laughs> um, um, in that task to, to when you retell something, effort avoidance. And then which then indicates indirectly for us to say that those things that remain might be ones that are, well, they avoid effort. They come without effort. Storytelling in general seems to be something that people are very willing to do. Every participant of our studies, they always leave a, a positive sign. It's not that we overpay them so much or so. They always say, I love your studies. Please give me more of those. They like this kind of storytelling in general. It's not very effortful. But I think that I will think more about this. What the dimension of that is effort avoidance and how that change, I mean, how that changes the particular words, the particular story elements that are used there. Because there are things that are troubling, like bad guys, and they have to be in the story, they're troubling, but they're not effort, it's something else now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Um, I think that the uh, my question is sort of along these lines, maybe going back to that example of the cat drawing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe what's at play is kind of something emotional, but still this idea of being able to uh, remember something which is a category from which you can serve as like a, a shorthand. And in this case, it's happening with like a symbol, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, like a concept for things that have extension, I guess, like cats. And mm -hmm. they remember, you know, if you're trying to draw an owl, people are kind of bad at drawing an owl, so you don't draw them as much, I guess. I don't know. 
seems pretty bad, and then they're trying to identify what it is. So they're kind of trying to mm -hmm. remember it a little bit, retain a visual image, but maybe they've also got a word they can start putting to it. They may say cat, they may stick to that. And what I'm, and, but there's still some variation, right? Mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering is, could that also be happening at the narrative level in the sense of these mm -hmm. uh, schemas or forms or arcs or mm -hmm. whatever you might want to call them that we kind of are able to, you know, say like, remember them. Like, yeah, or, yeah. Maybe we don't have like a word for them, yeah. you know, but yeah, we could say like the man in the whole box or whatever. Yes, right? yeah, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Follow on again or whatever. Um, and once we kind of hear a story, Mm -hmm. in this context of thinking about stories and thinking about these things and so on you know we go oh it's a building's roman or whatever mm -hmm. and then we go what goes in that building? Mm -hmm. well there were these characters let mm -hmm. me you know in that you pluck in some that yes and so yes what i'm i guess what i'm asking is like is it possible or is this just maybe also what you're saying or you agree with this or it's separate i don't know that yes there is this mm -hmm. form or mm -hmm. this arc, or you know, some representation of it that seems to, you know, maybe we learn it from hearing all these stories and so on and identifying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that that actually maybe becomes part of what we think a narrative is trying to convey. And so when we're trying mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. tell a story to convey, we're trying yeah. to pay yeah. attention to the arc or the form, and that's kind of what we're recreating. And we may remember some details about the story that we know, like it's into mm -hmm. this so, uh, but, yes mm -hmm. but that's not really what we're remembering because the point of the yeah. narrative is the arc there is there's something i don't know yeah yeah i mean it, it, there's a whole very 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 good very good i like a lot what you say so first thing about this this comes back also to anna's point about effort if you look at these kind of repaintings mm -hmm. by the way they, they're effortful i mean this this would have been faster this you can do in three seconds this one takes at least 15 seconds, and this probably is 20 seconds as the bow and things are more accentuated. So people are sometimes willing to invest more. You have the same thing with stories too, that there are some stories where people are willing to invest and to embellish and prove. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about one of the largest reservoirs nowadays of stories is like fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, there's hundreds of millions of people who go and produce fan fiction now. It's incredible numbers there who go on the internet and they find their fairy, favorite, famous fairy tale, lots of these fairy tales, but also TV series or novel, and they add other elements to it. They, they, they go all of it. So they are very willing to do that. And so that, again, is, is an indication that it's some, some of, it's not seen as effort, it's something else. Mm -hmm. um, and but what exactly that motiv motivates people for that is interesting. So in the case of the owl, there was no one doing that. It was, I mean, the first three drawings not bad, but it all everything reduces complexity, every single one here, up to basically this start point here, these two points, and then it improves here. I mean, these are bad reproductions here. They remain basically the same, but there are people are maintaining that. So some other something about that um, that people are willing to do, and they invest in that. So in that sense, I mean, say something similar. Emotional arc, I did not talk about much. I mentioned it on site. Very essential stories. And that's the question, of course, with images. Do they have, can they have this kind of emotional arc of satisfaction? Now you have to draw. Drawing, it takes time. So you have the satisfaction here. I, in, for this image here, I don't know if you can see that. I imagine that the redraw had a lot of satisfaction when he or she was done having this, making this little bowl. And then it was done. It's a temporal emotional art potentially in this and stories that is we now i mean we basically know you cannot have an emotion if there's not a gap between beginning and end you need this arc that's one of the key features so we have some that we've done some analysis but just leave it as that thank you okay thank you Yeah.